to number number 200 number 200 my sins are blotted out what a blessing to know our sins are blotted out if you're saved today sing out with me on hymn number 200 what a wondrous message in God's word my sins are blotted out I know if I trust in his redeeming blood my sins are blotted out I know sins are blotted out, I know. My sins are blotted out, I know. They are buried in the depths of the deepest sea. My sins are blotted out, I know. Once my heart was black, but now what joy. My sins are blotted out, I know. I have peace that nothing can destroy. My sins are blotted out, I know. My sins are blotted out, I know. My sins are blotted out, I know. They are buried in the depths of the deepest sea. My sins are blotted out. I shall stand someday before my King. My sins are blotted out, I know. With a ransomed host I then shall see. My sins are blotted out, I know. My sins are blotted out, I know. My sins are blotted out, I know. Praise the Lord. Hey, they are buried in the depths of the sea. That sounds pretty biblical to me. Does that sound biblical to you? Yes, it does. Can anybody guess? Take a passage. Let's do it this way. How about Old Testament, New Testament? Okay, you guessed right. Hey, you you got a pretty, a, a, well, you had a pretty good chance. It was a 50%. You could be right or wrong. So praise the Lord. Okay, now we have 39 books. Now, that's a bigger uh, option there here. Let's see here. How about this? We'll boil it down to Micah chapter 7. The Bible tells us this. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. I'm just wondering if that isn't where the songwriter maybe got some ideas about our sins are buried in the depths of the sea. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Hey, you think about it, folks. When you came to Christ, your sin was uh, cared for by Christ not just simply covered, but removed. And uh, how far did he remove that? Well, he removed it as far as the east is from the west. Can you get any further than that? No, you can't. Uh, that's an interesting study in itself. They are buried in the depths of the sea. They're hid behind his back, and he's chosen to remember them no more. What a great God we have with regard to our sin. So I'm thankful for that message. I'm thankful for Dallas leading us in song here this morning. You know why Dallas was leading us in song, don't you? Yes, that is because Pastor Josh and Megan have other things on her mind. In fact, I believe she is about ready to give birth if she hasn't already in the last uh, maybe half hour or so. But uh, he texted us about 9 o'clock and said things were really happening. And so, so we're hoping and praying that uh, there will be a little baby girl born into this world. So we're going to bow for a word of prayer to that end. And I do have something else I want to share with you real quick here. Let me and so we're going to pray for this. Uh, this is really unfortunate news. This is sad news. So Baptist Children's Home sent me uh, an email last night. Maybe if you're on their thread, you got the same one from Linda Brooks. Linda Brooks is the, the gal that we watched last week, and she gave us an update with her ministry all around the world and all kinds of stuff. So this one just came in last night about 5 o'clock in the evening. 
And it said, uh, I will update you more fully next week, but I'm asking for prayer for partner Grace. The situation for her and the 30 children continues to intensify. Now, I don't know if Grace is the name of a home, if it's the name of a person, but she has 30 children under her responsibility, and she's in Myanmar, and the military is requesting information with regard to every resident within their home. And Grace has chosen not to furnish that information, not to give that information. And for good reason, uh, there's, there's pros and cons. Either you comply, uh, and if you comply, then what are they going to do? Come to the home and then uh, take advantage of all those children, uh, or you ignore it and hope that they don't bother you any longer. So they have chosen not to, uh, but it's the military coup that there really is requesting this information, and uh, Grace is saying we're not going to do that. So. It really, it really is, uh, the situation is intensified with regard to at least one of the homes that, that uh, Baptist Children's Home uh, supports there in Myanmar. So we're going to pray for Megan John, and we're going to pray for the situation in Baptist Children's Home, and then uh, our service today as well. Father, what a, what a joy and a delight to be able to come before you, realizing, Lord, that the access that we have with you right here today is all because of that finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And Lord, uh, I'm so thankful that he paid our sin debt in full. He paid the price for our, uh, our sin. He became our substitute and died in our place. And Lord, I'm thankful that uh, when he took care of that sin, he did take care of it. He buried it in the depths of the sea as we just sang about. It was blotted out. It was hid behind his back. Uh, it is removed as far as the east from the west, and he chooses to rem you choose to remember it no more. Lord, what a, what a wonderful God we have. What a wonderful forgiveness that we have because of our sin. And Lord, it's because of that that we even have an avenue. We, we can talk with you here this morning. We can commune with you. I'm thankful, Lord, that this is not just part of a, a vein or an empty ritual. We just uh, say a bunch of words, but there really is nothing behind it. Lord, uh, to think that we can have an audience with you, the very God of heaven, the one and only God, the God who, again, truly gives us the breath we now breathe is really an incredible thought. And it's all been made possible because of your son who has become our savior. And Lord, I pray that those that are watching, those maybe even here today, those that know not Christ, maybe today will be the day of salvation. And Lord, for that, we certainly give you praise. Lord, we do think of Megan this morning here, and I do pray that you administer to her needs. Uh, we know it's a challenge to bring a child into this world, and we're just praying, Lord, that you'll give those that are caring for her wisdom and understanding. Uh, we're praying for a healthy uh, delivery here, Lord, a healthy baby. And, uh, Lord, we're, we're looking forward to hearing this news here as uh, maybe this hour unfolds. But, Lord, uh, be with them, care for them, and meet, meet her every need. And, Lord, for that, we'll thank you. And then we think of Grace there in Myanmar and these 30 children that are under her care. And uh, Lord, uh, we know it's a, a bold and brazen move uh, not to comply with this military coup that is really uh, wrecking havoc there in that land. Uh, Lord, I pray that you put a hedge of protection about this home, uh, these young children, Lord. Uh, we long to see uh, them uh, spared, uh, have life, uh, come to know uh, the giver of life, and then want to live for you and really make a difference in that land of Myanmar. So Lord, uh, we're asking for a special a hedge of protection about uh, grace and, and these 30 children. And Lord, for that, we're going to thank you. Lord, we're grateful that we could gather here this morning and sing your praises. And we do pray that you'll bless our time as we, uh, we look uh, into your word and study it together. I pray that you'll speak to our hearts, challenge us, change us. May we again leave different than we came. And may you get all the glory for whatever's accomplished. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen and amen. You may be seated. And as you're taking your seats, we are going to just do a couple quick things here, and we will go from there. I think I have a couple of announcements here, and then we'll read some scripture here this morning. So let me just share this with you. Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, is a quarterly business meeting. And I hope that you all be back for that. I know that we've had several business meetings in the last uh, couple of months. But, hey, listen, come on back out again this coming Wednesday. Please do that for I think there's some real important things that we discuss. And number one, we always deal with the budget, how we are in the first quarter. So there are some budget reports that will be available to you as you exit the building today. They'll be available in the foyer there, so please pick one of those up. And then we'll be discussing our missionaries and a number of things going on with our missionaries, and we just want to stay current and up-to-date and really hear from you with regard to where we're going to go with all of that. So do be praying for uh, this coming Wednesday. I hope that you'll be here for it. That would be great. 
Remember a number of our folks, it seems like this is the season to be traveling, and so we have them from Maine to Arizona and maybe somewhere in between all of that. So remember a number of our folks that you don't see here today, and uh, that would be much appreciated. And then uh, let me just say that at the, the end of May, the 23rd of May, I believe, we start uh, some, uh, some revival meetings. Uh, we're going to have a new evangelist here. His name is Jake DeAndrea. And uh, he will be here, and he's going to be doing some work, but he'll also be preaching for us uh, here in just uh, about a month away or so. So do pray for those meetings. Hope that you'll be here. Trust that the Lord will bless our time together, and uh, God will again do a great work in our lives here with regard to those meetings. So that's coming up, and I, I trust it will be a blessing to all of us. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Psalms 51. Psalm 51 here for our scripture reading this morning. Uh, psalm 51, Pastor Josh thought this would be a great psalm, and it is a great psalm, dealing with this area of the fruit of repentance. And uh, you'll see in this text here a great, great uh, cry of, of uh, recognizing sin and asking God to really have uh, uh, mercy upon David. I'll be referring to this uh, maybe just in a passing way this morning in the message um, this is after David was confronted with his sin with Bathsheba. And so Nathan, the prophet of God, has come to him, and he's going to reveal this sin. And David, David doesn't try to cover it up at this point in time. He knows that he's been now caught, and uh, he really does cry out a prayer of repentance. You know, it's kind of interesting as you just think about this here. You know, uh, if uh, you've been a child at one time, uh, you've maybe had children. Uh, you know... Um, do you ever catch a child in the act of doing wrong or sinning and uh, all of a sudden that child is really repentant? Uh, they are so sorry. Well, they're sorry because they got caught, not so much sorry because they really violated a rule of mom or dad or whatever it might be. So there's really a difference, I think. Uh, and as a parent, you get to know your children and you can pretty much discern, is this a genuine repentance or is this a repentance because... Uh, I got caught with my hand in the cookie jar, and, and uh, I can't get out of this. Uh, I really believe that this is a genuine prayer of repentance. David comes full circle, realizes the error of his way. He's tried to cover it up, but mark it down. You, you, you can't cover up your sin. You just can't do that. Be sure your sin will find you out. The book of Numbers tells us that, and uh, that's the truth of the matter, and you've heard me say this a number of times. You can't sweep it under the carpet, hope it goes away, and nobody will ever know. It just doesn't work that way. First of all, God knows and sees all, so he knows what's going on. And uh, believe me, that sin will bite you. Uh, so the best thing to do is confess it and forsake it, as uh, the book of Proverbs tells us. And so we're going to look at that here in just a few minutes. But you're in Psalm 51. We're going to read the first 12 verses, and I like it to read it responsively. So let's stand for the reading of God's word, Psalm 51, and we'll read verses 1 through 12 responsively as unto the Lord. So I begin in verse 1 by reading, again, this is David's heart cry, and, and uh, would to God this be our prayer when we sin against God. That's the whole intent here. David writes this for us in Psalm 51, beginning in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Amen. So, folks, when you are confronted with sin, by, by way of the Holy Spirit of God, when the Holy Spirit of God convicts you, you just said something, did something, 
you know you just sinned against God. Have you ever run to Psalm 51 and cried out those words? Boy, what a prayer of repentance. That's a good place to run to, folks. And uh, let's not kid ourselves. We sin. We all sin. Uh, but this is a good place. If you want to know how to properly get before God and say, God, I have sinned, and I'm asking, I'm begging you to, to blot out my iniquities, to wash me clean, pour out your mercy on me. There, there are some great, great things in here for, for you and I to study. This would be a great place to go to, but we're not going to camp here this morning, but I, I certainly hope that this will be embedded in your mind, in your heart, and it might be a passage of Scripture that you'll run to as uh, sin knocks on the door of your heart and your life. And so it'd be a great place to go. Thank you for the reading of God's word. You may be seated. We're going to sing another song at this time. Hymn number 197. It is the promise of God full salvation to give. Unto him who on Jesus his son will believe. Hallelujah, it is done. I believe on the Son. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. Hallelujah, it is done. I believe on the Son. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. playing appreciate your ministry of music here and helping us out uh, this morning greatly appreciate that hey listen hallelujah tis done i believe on the son i'm saved by the blood of the crucified one you know we were just talking about psalm 51 and i just want to be really really clear in this whole area so uh let me just say this you know man is a sinner that's his nature right? you were born with that that sin nature in fact we just read that in scripture in sin did my mother conceive me in psalm 51 uh, that wasn't the act of, of conception. It was the nature that was passed on by way of that conception. So that's how you inherited your sinful nature. Uh, that sin nature needs to be cared for by the blood of Christ. And uh, we call that salvation. We call that becoming born again, as, as Jesus uses that terminology in John chapter 3. Uh, that's where you get before the cross and realize that Jesus died on that cross for my sin. And by faith, I cry out to him and ask him to forgive me of my sin. And that sin nature then is covered by that blood, it, uh, by the blood of Christ. It is, it is washed away. You are made clean in the eyes of God. So that 
in a judicial fashion, your sins, past, present, and future, have all been taken care of by the blood of Christ because you cried out to Christ, realizing that he was dying as your substitute on the cross and asked him to be your savior. And you got saved. Now, when you get saved, you only get saved one time. You don't get saved every day. You don't get saved every week. You don't get saved every time you sin. From that point of salvation, you will go on and live your life, but you will sin. Uh, you are not sinlessly perfect, and that's because you have an old sinful nature that still resides within you. At the moment of salvation, you got a new nature, but you still have the old nature. So you have two natures now, and they are fighting against each other. They're warring for your life. There's a real battle that's taking place. So salvation took place in a moment. It took place when you recognized who Christ did. And that's what I really believe. Hallelujah, tis done. I believe on the Son. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. That took place in a moment of time. But then you go on and begin that walk with Christ. And you begin to live the Christian life. And you realize that, boy, sometimes that sinful nature just keeps winning out. It keeps beating me down. And, and I cave into it. And there's no excuse because God has given us the power to have victory over that sin nature. But for whatever reason, you and I, we sin. That's where we go to God in prayer like Psalm 51, and we confess our sin. We don't have to say, Lord, I need to get saved again. No, you're already saved. You're confessing, Lord, I just sinned against you. I, I just said, I just did, I, whatever it is, I did this, Lord, and I'm asking for your mercy. I'm asking to be washed clean of that sin. I want to be right with you. We would call that like a parental forgiveness. You know, when you're born into a family of God, or into a family, I often use this as an illustration. I know this is a little bit lengthy, but I want you to really be clear, because we're going to talk about a little bit of this this morning. You know, the uh, Lord's blessed us with children. The Lord's going to, Lord willing, bless the John family with a little, little baby girl here. Uh, that, that child will be uh, uh, Pastor Josh and Megan's their whole life. Now, they're going to hope and pray that by God's grace they raise that child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and that that child will live for the Lord all her days. That's the goal of a parent. But supposing that child doesn't. Supposing that child or one of my kids, I'll use myself as the example, goes wayward. Are they still your child? Yes. You know why? Because they were born to you. They will forever be your child. Are you happy with how they're living their life? No. No, I'm not happy with the way they're living their life because they're living in sin. But they're still your child. That's the picture. When you are born again, you become a child of God. It takes place in a moment of time. I hope all here today are born again. Hope you that are watching at home are born again. Birthed into the family of God. You became a child of his. Saved and you will forever be with him. But that doesn't mean that your walk between that moment and the day that the Lord takes you home is going to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Unfortunately, unfortunately. No excuses. We're not, we're not saying, well, it's just couldn't help it. No, God has given you the ability to have victory over sin. You don't have to live in sin, but you will sin. When you sin, run to Psalm 51, cry out that prayer, just like David did. David was a child of the Lord. He was a believer. David recognized I sin, and that's what that, sin is all about. that's what that confession is all about. So I hope that you really understand that very clearly, and that's what we're going to be talking about here today. We're talking about a believer and really some of the fruit of repenting, uh, what, what really comes as a result of a believer getting right with God, not covering our sin, but confessing and forsaking it. Ah, that individual will receive the mercy of God, and happy is the man that feareth the Lord. He's also going to be a happy man, and that's what I want to talk about today here this morning. All right, well, hey, that's a prelude. Uh, get ready. There's more coming. Uh, praise the Lord. Hey, listen, uh, we're going to take our Bibles and turn to the book of Proverbs, that passage of Scripture that we've been looking at the last couple of weeks. And as we are doing so, we're going to encourage our young people to head downstairs to Children's Church. Trust that the Lord will bless them as they head downstairs. Proverbs chapter 28 is where we want to go. Children in the age of uh, 12 and under can head downstairs, and I trust the Lord will bless their time together down there. Proverbs chapter 28 passage of scripture that we were just in last week, and uh, I trust that the Lord will bless me. I'm in it again here this morning, so I didn't know this would be a two-part message, but uh, you know, as I got before the Lord this week, and I was praying for direction with regard to the uh, theme for the month, and that deals with the idea of repentance, uh, I kept coming back to verse 14, and I never saw this like I did uh, until this week here, and so I trust that the Lord will bless our time here 
together in his word. I want you to look at again Proverbs chapter 28 verses 13 and now we're adding 14 to it. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. That we talked about last week. We'll develop that maybe a little bit further. Then verse 14, Happy is the man that feareth alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. I want you to see two things here this morning. I want you to see that the fruit of repentance is the mercy of God. Look at verse 13, the latter part of it. Those that confess and forsake their sin shall have mercy. I know I just touched on that last week, but I'm going to touch on it a lot longer here this morning. The whole message could be preached on the mercy of God. But listen, those that repent of their sin shall have mercy, the mercy of God. Secondly, I want you to understand, happy is the man that feareth alway, and I believe it's in the context. The man that has a healthy, wholesome dread of displeasing God and recognizes his sin and confesses it and forsakes it will be a happy individual. Uh, I want to talk about happy is the man. Uh, the, the happy man. Uh, I think that there's a place for that. And uh, we really need to see some of that here this morning. So I trust that the Lord will bless our time as we look at this text here a little bit closer this morning. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on the ministry of his word and then we'll take up the text. Father, again, it's already been good to be here to sing your praises. And truly, Lord, uh, you are worthy. Uh, Lord, we will be doing that for all of eternity. It will never get old. I pray it's never old in this world. Uh, what a joy to be able to come and unite voices uh, uh, around a common thought, a uh, common hymn. Uh, a songwriter who took uh, your word and, and uh, developed a, a whole theme around uh, such things as our sins being blotted out or buried in the depths of the sea. And wonderful truths that we can reflect on and really prepare our heart for the study of your word. Thankful, Lord, for your word. I'm thankful that we have it in our laps. I'm happy that we have minds that, that can uh, understand and comprehend the truths of your word. Now, we know that we need the Holy Spirit of God here this morning to be our ultimate, the ultimate teacher. Uh, this preacher simply will be a mouthpiece for some of the things that you've shown me this week. But, Lord, I pray that as I speak, I'll speak the truth. I'll speak, again, the, uh, the wonderful truths that are found here in these two verses and I pray, Father, each of us will again leave here differently and rejoicing in the great work, the great fruit that comes from an individual who gets right with you. And, Lord, for that, we're going to thank you. Bless our time here this morning. May you get glory, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's just look at this real quick by way of a review very, very quickly here. Verse 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Heard a little bit about that last week, and I want to just remind you that I, I will tell, tell you this. I think the sin nature of man is to want to cover up his sin. Uh, we don't want to be embarrassed by it. We don't want other people to know about it. And so, hey, listen, if we can, if we can kind of keep it under the radar and just kind of keep it uh, hidden from other people, we think that all is well and good. Listen, eradicate that way of thinking. Uh, praise God for the Holy Spirit of God. I know we often talk about the Father. We talk about the, Holy, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work in God. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. Uh, he is the one that convicted us of our need of Christ, and He is the one that continues to convict us of our sin. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to, again, shape us and mold us into the image of Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So listen. You and I are going to sin. That's reality. That's not a license to sin. It's just reality. And when you do, deal with it. Don't try to cover it up. You will not further advance in your walk with the Lord. You shall not prosper, it says. Uh, they're not good things that are going to come. Uh, you're going to feel miserable. You're going to, uh, as, as David said in Psalm 32, he felt like all his bones were out of joint and he was aching and, and it was just, it was a horrible feeling. I don't know if you've ever been there, folks, but I've been there. I dare say you may have been there as well. You know it. Uh, I know it. And that's the Holy Spirit of God trying to tell us something about it. So what does he say? Well, confess it. Uh, forsake it. Do both. Don't just confess it and acknowledge it. Well, okay, I sinned. No, that's acknowledging. That's first step. Second step, forsake it. I never want to do this again, Lord. I am sorry that I've sinned against you. And uh, Lord, I'm asking for help that I never go down that road again. I don't want to do this again, Lord. I want to forsake that, turn from that sin. 
I really believe in that particular passage of Scripture really deals with this idea of repentance. It's a change of mind. It's a, it's a change of view toward your sin. And so you don't want to do that again. And uh, you're asking God for that help. And so I believe that this would be a picture of Old Testament repentance, confessing and forsaking their sin. Now, here's the promise that comes from that. When you do it that way, you don't cover it up. You confess it and forsake it. The Bible says in verse 13, uh, they shall have mercy. I want to talk about the mercy of God a little bit more in depth today. The mercy of God. And I think this is real important for us to really understand something about the mercy of God. Because I think sometimes we use these words. We use grace. We use mercy. We use justice. We use holiness. We use different terms. But, but do we really grasp the, the fullness and the depth of that word mercy? And so I, I want to really talk about, hey, here's some fruit. You will receive the mercy of God, and that is a good thing. I'm so grateful for the mercy of God. So let's just talk about it quickly. A number of points here. Number one, mercy really is God's tenderhearted, loving kindness and compassion for needy people. If you weren't needy, you wouldn't need mercy. But you and I are needy people. And mercy really, again, is God's love and compassion that he pours out to needy people. Now you say, well, I already knew that. Yep, I know. I know. Hang in there. Uh, but but that's, the, that's a definition. If you want to know, it's the tenderhearted, loving kindness, and compassion for needy people. Mercy is not something that God owes us. Let's, let's eradicate that thinking. And by the way, you know, I, I really try to make this relevant to where I live, and I hope it's relevant to... Don't ever abuse the mercy of God. Don't ever abuse the grace of God. Don't ever think, well, hey, I can sin, or, or you know that you're about ready to cross that threshold into sin, and in the back of your mind you're thinking, well, I'll confess it somewhere down the road. I'll, I'll get right with God somewhere down the road. But for now, no, I just see the pleasure of sin, and therefore I'm going to cross that line, and I'm going to do it. That's abusing the mercy of God. That's why I say, don't you, don't you think that for a moment that God owes you a thing? He doesn't owe us anything. Uh, if, if he owed us something, it wouldn't be mercy. Uh, and so mercy is, again, God's love and compassion that is poured out toward needy people. And it is not something that he owes us. By definition, it can't be owed. It cannot be owed. But it is something that God extends in kindness and grace toward us. Number two, I believe that God's mercy is extended, now listen to this, to all of mankind, but it will not be extended to all of mankind forever. I believe all of mankind is the recipient of the mercy of God to some degree or another. For instance, it's like God who makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. God treats mankind equally in that sense. God is gracious to mankind. God is merciful to mankind. God extends mercy to all of mankind. God's love and kindness and compassion is extended to all of mankind. But man, man is a sinner. And that sin must be judged. So mercy will triumph over judgment. If Here's the big condition. If that individual recognizes the error of his way. If that individual recognizes, God, you've been merciful to me my whole life, and I've never, I've never had a relationship with you, but you've been merciful to me. And, Lord, I am crying out to you for deliverance of that bondage of sin. Uh, I want that nature of sin cared for by the blood of Christ. God will extend his mercy to you. I believe that God's greatest demonstration of mercy is at the moment of salvation. The moment you got saved, God extended an incredible amount of mercy. And we're going to see some of that here this morning to you. When you cried out, Lord, I am a sinner in need of Jesus Christ to be my Savior, whoosh, here comes the mercy of God. The greatest, in my opinion, demonstration of God's mercy. Number three, man's sinful uh, nature deserves God's impending wrath. Because of your sinful nature, you know what you deserve? Not mercy, not grace, judgment. Judgment. God is a holy God. God hates sin. We are sinners. What we deserve is God's wrath. 
And yet God will often extend his mercy to us. Listen to that passage of scripture that no doubt many of you are familiar with in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. But listen to the picture that Paul paints for us in Ephesians 2. He's writing to believers now and he says, and you hath he quickened. In other words, he's made alive. Uh, the idea, you've been born again. You've been saved. You've been made alive. And you hath he quickened who were dead, past tense, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. We were worldlings. Prior to salvation, we walked according to the course of the world. We just were puppets, as it were. We're just following what the world does. We talk like them. We act like them. We sin like them. We're just following the course of the world. Now, I want to say this here because maybe some of you got saved at a young age. And if you did, you praise God. You ought to be probably shouting hallelujah from the highest of rooftops. Because God has given you that privilege at a young age to come to know him, and he has spared you from a lot of muck and mess that's in this world. Some of us didn't get saved until later in life. So we know what the world has to offer. And we did walk according to the course of this world. And, uh, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a shameful life. It wasn't a life that God was pleased with. He gave me life and breath to glorify him, and I didn't glorify him for 20-some years of my life. So we were dead in trespasses and sins. We walked according to the course of this world, according, to listen to this, the prince of the power of the air. You know who that is? The devil. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's really calling the shots. There's, there really is a devil. Uh, he's deemed here the prince of the power of the air, and he's got control and influence in the world in which we live. He walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And that's where I was. That's where you were. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of the flesh, there was a craving within us to feed ourselves, as it were, to feed our sinful nature, to do as we wanted to do, when and how and why and all those things, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's not a very pretty picture that Paul is painting, but he is reminding believers in Ephesus, this is how you were. And then he says... But God, oh, what a contrast. But God, who is rich in mercy. God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even as we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. What a wonderful contrast. Here's how I was. Here's how I am. How did that happen? The mercy of God. The mercy of God. The greatest demonstration of mercy was in, when an individual bows his knee and confesses with his tongue, Jesus Christ is Lord. I become the recipient of mercy. That's a wonderful place, folks. That's a wonderful place to live. Titus would go on and tell us it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You know, God would be just. Now listen, God would be just in condemning us to hell. If, if, if every one of us, if all 7.2 billion people on the face of the earth were condemned to hell today, you know what? God would be just in doing that. God would be just. But his mercy has spared a good many of those 7.2 billion people on the face of the earth. I don't know how many of, of all the population on the earth are truly born again. A good many. Certainly not the majority. Why is that? Well, listen, straight is the, the, uh, the, the, the road and, and wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction. And so there's many that are, uh, that, well, and straight is the gate that leadeth to heaven, but wide is the gate and narrow is the way. I'm getting it all mixed up there along those lines. But there are many that are on their way to hell and uh, very few that are on their way to heaven, and that's unfortunate. So if justice and mercy were a plant, somebody said this, justice is the stem and mercy is the flower. God is pleased to show his mercy. Jonathan Edwards, an old Puritan, wrote this, according to his own sovereign pleasure, God was pleased to show his mercy. Though he is infinitely above all and stands in need of no creatures, he is graciously pleased to take mercy uh, upon 
poor worms in the dust. And that's how Edwards viewed mankind as just a worm. And yet God pours out his mercy. So praise God. Hey, listen, mercy is God's tender heart, loving kindness, compassion for needy people. I believe that mercy is extended upon all of mankind. I believe because of our sinful nature, we don't deserve the mercy of God. We deserve the wrath of God. But here's the beauty. God's wrath and God's mercy met there at the cross. It met at the cross. And I want you to think about this. Uh, I want you to even go back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the priest, the high priest in particular, was in charge of uh, really uh, visiting the Holy of Holies, a, a very, very holy place. There was the tabernacle divided in two. There was the holy place and the Holy of Holies. And inside of the Holy of Holies was the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a rectangular box, plated in gold, and on top of it sat a seat uh, that, was, uh, that had two cherubim that were facing each other. And, and the cherubim are often a picture of, uh, they're angels that are a picture of really protecting the holiness of God. And so if you went into, and of course you would not be a privilege to do that, only the high priest, only one person out of all of Israel, was allowed to go into that place, and he could only go in once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And, uh, and he had to go in with blood in his hand because he was going to take blood and sprinkle it on that mercy seat. Now listen, what was underneath the mercy seat? The Ark of the Covenant. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? Well, for one, there were the Ten Commandments, the two tablets. The two tablets, the two, the, uh, known as the Ten Commandments, really, really described the perfection of God and really demanded the perfection of man. These Ten Commandments depict a perfect God, and this perfect God says, that's what I want in mankind. But mankind can't fulfill that. Mankind is not perfect. That's what even David said. I was conceived as sin. From the time I was born, I received this sinful nature. So, so there's this dilemma. God is demanding perfection, yet man can't fulfill that perfection. So, so how can we reconcile? How can we bring these two things together? Oh, on top of that ark is the mercy seat. That mercy seat has blood applied to it, covering the sin of mankind year after year after year. And a picture, a picture of the one who would be the mercy seat, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he would go to that cross, he would shed his blood and not simply cover your sin, but remove your sin. What a great picture that we have in Christ. And again, depicted in the Old Testament by way of this mercy seat. The mercy seat uh, really speaks of a propitiation. In fact, that word propitiation is often translated mercy. And Christ is the propitiation for our sins, but not our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. And that word propitiation is a big fancy word, but it simply means he completely satisfied the demands of his father with regard to the cost and price of sin when he again died on that cross for us. So God being the holy God that he is cannot let sin into heaven. He cannot let sin into heaven. There is no sin in heaven. Remember, Lucifer tried and Lucifer was booted. Uh, there is no sin. It, it is a perfect environment because there's a perfect God who lives there. So how are we ever going to get to heaven? Ah, plead the mercy of God. Recognize what the cross means. Recognize who it was that died on that cross. Therein lies mercy for mankind. And that's a wonderful picture. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. And uh, we have a great picture in that. Quickly, mercy, the mercy of God is, again, extending compassion to those that deserve to be punished. That would be us. Again, mercy is going to triumph over judgment. Our God is a God who is long-suffering toward us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the beauty of this mercy here, I want you to understand quickly, is this mercy never runs out. Uh, there is an endless supply of God's mercy. Somebody likened it to the waves of the sea. They just keep on coming and coming and coming. I don't know about you, but I love to be at the beach, and I just love to look at those waves, and those waves never run out. They, they never get tired of running. They just, one after another, just keep crashing 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, year after year. The, those waves just keep crashing on shore. The mercy of God never runs out. 
I believe it was David Jeremiah that said this, there is no empty on the mercy tank in heaven. It is always supplied. And that is, again, supplied by, by way of verses. Ephesians, the one that we read, God is rich in mercy. First Peter would tell us that uh, we have been uh, delivered according to the abundant mercy that has begotten us unto a lively hope. We have a, 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 an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, fadeth not away, and is reserved in heaven. And it's all because of this abundant mercy of God. Now, quickly, I know that we sometimes identify with pictures of Scripture, sometimes more than all of that, but that's important for us to understand. I want you to think of just a couple of quick pictures with mercy here, because we're talking about the one that repents of their sin receives this mercy. By the way, God doesn't show his mercy by accident. It's not by weakness. It's by intention and with strength that God extends this. Think of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a king that uh, ruled uh, over Jerusalem, uh, Judah, the southern nation. He comes on the throne, and uh, he's about eight years into his, his uh, reign. And the year is now about 716 B.C. Uh, the northern nation of Israel has now been overthrown by the Assyrians. All right, So remember, there's the divide. We can do all the history. But there was the divide, and, and now uh, they've been taken over by the Assyrians. And, uh, and for a couple hundred years, they have been living in rebellion against God. Remember with uh, uh, Jeroboam, he took them out of uh, the, the pack of 12, and the 10 nations went to the north, and, and they set up some golden calves and began to worship false gods, all this kind of stuff. So Hezekiah comes on the throne. He's the king. And uh, he wants to restore the, the feast of the Passover. Now, the Passover, again, really is a picture of the mercy of God. Remember, God is going to free his people there from Egypt. And so he tells the Israelites, this is what you need to do. And if you do this, you'll be spared. Mercy of God. Of course, the ultimate Passover was Christ. All right, so Hezekiah is the king, and, and he wants the southern nation to observe this very important feast. And uh, he extends an olive branch to the northern nation. Now, this was really commendable on the part of King Hezekiah. He sends messengers up to the north and says, hey, listen, we're, we're one. We may, be, have, we may have been divided for the last couple hundred years for, for various reasons, but hey, listen, you're still got Israel ties, ties to, to our God, and, and God has instructed us to observe this Passover, and so I'm asking you to come and let's join together and observe this feast uh, as, a, as, a, as a people of God. Well, some will scoff at that. Think, well, who's he think he is? I mean, they're already living in rebellion, but there will be the remnant. The Bible makes it very clear. There's a remnant of believers that heed the call and make their way down to Jerusalem and observe the Passover. But here's the text. Listen to the text quickly. Here's what Hezekiah would say. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. That's what we want. We don't want God's wrath. We want the wrath of God turned away from us. For he says, if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land, for the Lord our God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. Hey, listen, folks, that's what it's all about. That's what... Solomon is writing about in Proverbs. If you confess and forsake your sin, you shall receive mercy. Hezekiah is saying the same thing to the northern nation, really to all of Israel. Hey, listen, don't think you got it all figured out. Don't be stiff-necked. Don't just continue down the same path. It's the wrong way to go. Hey, return to the Lord. He is a gracious and merciful God. He will restore you. He will bless you. You will prosper in him. If you choose to keep going your way, well, you're going to pay the consequences. Some obeyed, and many didn't. But that's Hezekiah. If we took time quickly, we could look at the prophets. We could look at Jonah in particular. You remember, you remember the reason why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh? 
Do you remember the reason? You know, he was told to go to Nineveh. He got on a ship and took off and went the opposite direction. Then there he is, swallowed up by this big whale, and he confesses his sin. He's spewed out, and, and then he finally goes. But you get the real crux of the matter when you get to chapter 4 of the book of Jonah. There's only four chapters. And you know what he says in that chapter? It displeased Jonah uh, exceedingly, and he was very angry, the Bible says. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? Apparently he confesses the Lord when I was yet in uh, my country. Therefore I fled before uh, unto Tarshish. For I knew, Jonah says, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. You know what he's saying? I didn't want Nineveh saved. I didn't want Nineveh. I know the character of you, God. And I know that you are gracious and merciful and slow to anger. And those Ninevites, they didn't deserve that. They were wicked to the depths of their being. They deserved your wrath, God. Therefore, I'm not going to go and be your messenger. I'm going the opposite way. Hey, praise God. Praise God for his mercy, even to wicked people. Oh, quickly, David's another one. We've already talked a little bit about him. We could look at a couple different instances in his life. And then I, I want to remind you again of that one passage of Scripture that we're all familiar with where Javid, uh, Jeremiah is writing about the limitations. He's lamenting over the, 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 the city that has fallen, the city of Jerusalem, and is brokenhearted. And if you really take some time and read uh, Lamentations chapter 3, uh, the first, I believe, 19 verses, 20 verses, you will see where, where David is caught up in, or I'm sorry, Jeremiah is caught up in anger. He also feels that he's been ostracized by God, that God has judged him as well. And, and it's really a, an incredible confession that, that Jeremiah has in Lamentations chapter 3. But here's the turning point. He gets to verse 21, and he says this, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Uh, all the, the wickedness that has fallen upon this, this city and this temple. And, and, and yes, we deserved it, but, but did you have to be so harsh, God? And, and uh, boy, I, I feel like there's no relationship. And all of this, Jeremiah comes to his senses and then says this. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. The wrath of God. The wrath of God on sin. God hates sin. In other words, hey, if you were not merciful, God, we would be destroyed. We'd be annihilated. Your wrath would be poured out, and we wouldn't even, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. It's because of your mercies, Lord, that we're not consumed. Get the picture again. This is, in the, this is the, the price of sin when it's covered up, glossed over, ignored, denied, whatever. That's what will come. But when it's confessed and forsaken, the mercy of God is poured out. He goes on and says, because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. And God's mercy toward us is unfaltering. God is a merciful, gracious, compassionate, faithful God. And how grateful we are for it. Well, hey, listen, we could say a lot more about that. I told you there's a lot to say about mercy. And I want you to understand from Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, don't cover your sin. You will not prosper. Confess and forsake it, and you can become the recipient of the mercy of God. Don't you want the mercy of God? I want the mercy. I need the mercy of God. I need it. I need it on a regular basis. And so I'm thankful for the mercy of God. But I want you to see this quickly here as well. I really believe it's important that we understand the very next verse. Happy is the man that feareth always. And the word fear there really has this idea of, of displeasing God. And so it's in the context of if I cover my sin, I'm not going to be pleasing to God. But, but this idea of happy is the man that feareth always, I, I want you to see that that is the fruit of repentance as well. You can be a happy Christian. In fact, I believe happy Christians are people who are living right in the eyes of God of the Lord. Hey, do you want to be happy? Yes, I think we all want to be happy. Now listen, we could dissect the word happy, we could look at the origin of the word, all kinds of stuff. And I know that I've often preached happiness is circumstantial. We're happy when things are going well. When things don't go well, we lose that happiness. 
Uh, but I want you to understand that there is a place for happiness in Christians. And I believe some of the happiest Christians in the world are people that are living right with God. They are happy. They got a right relationship with God. They call sin, sin. They don't deny it. Again, they don't cover it up. They deal with it. And I really believe happy is the man that feareth the Lord always. Let's just stop here for a minute, though. This is very important, very important. How do you deal with sin? And don't answer that out loud. I don't think any of us would want to. Do you see yourself as a sinner? Honestly. Now, I'm not talking about salvation. That's why we already covered all that. You're saved. I trust that you are born again. I hope that you have a personal relationship with God through faith in Christ. So you sin. Did you sin at all this week? Yesterday? Day before? Thoughts? Words? Actions? Did you sin? How did you deal with it? Do you deal with it? Do you just like, no, I shouldn't have done that. Okay, moving on. Or do you really deal with it? When was the last time that you had a talk with God about sin? Seriously. When did you talk to God about sin? Oh, Lord, I don't know why I did that. I, I, don't know what, I don't know what drives me that way. I mean, when was the last you talked to God about sin? Folks, I believe it ought to be a, a, a frequent occurrence. Yea, daily. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. I think the Holy Spirit will reveal that to us. John writes about this in 1 John chapter 5. This is the message that we heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Oh, listen, all of us look like we have had a relationship with God this week. All of us look like we're in fellowship with God. We're in church today. Praise the Lord for that. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light... We have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, you ever been there? You ever been there? We deceive ourselves. If you don't think you're sinning, you're deceiving yourself. That's what God says, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, praise God. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and then he closes if we say that we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar. And his word is not in us. Hey, folks, I ask the question because it's a very serious question. What do you do with sin in your life? Really, when was the last you talked to God about sin? You have a conversation with him about it? You're not going to be a happy man. I can guarantee you that. Because happy Christians are Christians that are right with God. They recognize sin. They deal with sin. We could look at a number of passages of Scripture. Uh, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, start there. And you can just work your way right through the book of Genesis. Remember, Eve saw that the, fruit, the, the, the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desired to make one wise. What she do? Well, she took of the fruit, gave it to her husband. They both ate immediately, immediately. And that's the way it works, folks. When you sin, it's immediate. The Spirit of God works in the heart of the believer who wants to be right with God. Now, you can get calloused. You can become hard-hearted. I get that. But if you're right with God, as soon as you sin, you know it. And what did they do? Well, they tried to cover their sin. That's what Proverbs is about. He that covered the sin shall not prosper. How did they try to cover Well, they made fig leaves. Fig leaves were covering that part of the body from which the propagation of mankind and sin would originate. They were attempting to hide their sin, mask their shame. Cover it up. That's the nature. And then they went and hid themselves. That's what we do. Let me ask you, were Adam and Eve happy at that moment? Of course not. They were outside of the will of God. They were living in sin. It had not been addressed. It had not been dealt with. God in his grace and, yea, mercy comes looking for them. Where are you? It wasn't a game of hide and seek. God knows all, sees all. He knew exactly what he, they did. He gives them an opportunity to confess. You remember what they did? Played the blame game. There's more cover-up. 
Adam won my fault, it was a woman. Eve said, won my fault, it was a serpent. The only honest one there that day was a serpent. He didn't blame anybody. But they're covering it up, blaming each other, and trying to, again, hide this from God. Folks, when we do that, we're not happy Christians. We're not happy. We're just not going to be where we are because we're not rightly related to God. Happy, verse 14 says, is the man that feareth always. Happy is the man that has a healthy, wholesome dread. God, I don't want to displease you. And when I live that kind of a life, and when sin comes my way, I confess and forsake it. The fruit of repentance is a happy individual. And I believe God wants us to be happy. Abraham, we could look at the life of Abraham. Abraham, again, he went down to Egypt. That was not God's will. He lied about his wife. That wasn't God's will. Let me ask you, if you stopped and knocked on Abraham's door, uh, Mr. Abraham, are you a happy individual right now? No, I'm pretty miserable. I'm not in a country where I'm supposed to be, and I just told a lie about my wife. But praise God for the mercy of God. The mercy of God was poured out upon him. He got another opportunity, and another opportunity, and another opportunity. If you want to have a fun time, go home and look up the word happy in Scripture. It appears numerous times, the word happy. It is also translated blessed. I believe a happy Christian is a blessed Christian. I believe a blessed Christian is a happy Christian. I believe they're used interchangeably. There are several root words in the Old Testament that deal with this, but listen, there's a, a parallel. And I could read all the verses that deal with the happy Christian or happy believer, and I could use the same word in for the idea of blessed. There are some, and I believe I probably have preached this, and I'll begin to wrap this up here quickly. I have believed I have probably preached that God does not call us to happiness, but to holiness. I believe there's a truth to that. We are called, be ye holy, for he is holy. So there is no question, no denying. But a holy Christian will be a happy Christian. I really believe that. Again, because he's rightly related to God. Charles Spurgeon said, holiness is the royal road to happiness. The death of sin is the life of joy. You want to be happy? You want to be filled with joy? Deal with sin. We don't pursue happiness. We pursue Christ, and therein is found happiness. You want to be happy? Pursue Christ. Live for him. You'll find happiness. Hey, our message to the world is, our message to the world, if you're looking to be happy, look no further. Find Christ. Therein is your happiness. You don't see Christ, you're going to be miserable. Oh, hey, listen, you can mask it, cover it up. You can, you can party with the world, hide it for a day or two, put a smile on your face. But inside, there's no joy. There's no happiness until you find Christ. And for the believer, walk with Christ. Deal with sin. Don't cover it up. Well, for the sake of time, we are out. But I would hope and pray that you would see that the fruit of repentance out of the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, is the mercy of God and the happiness of man. And both of those are available to you and to me that name Christ as our Savior if we again choose to walk with him and be the person he wants us to be. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, I pray that all of us leave here with a real hunger, a real hunger to be the person of God that you want us to be. Oh, Lord, we don't want to play Christian. We don't want to go through the motions. We don't want to just have church. We don't want to just show up once a week and pretend that all is well. Lord, you know all, you see all, you know where we have been, what we have thought, what we have said, what we have done. Lord, I pray that we would again give a, a true analysis to our walk with you. That we would ask you again to search our heart, to reveal the ugliness of sin that we may have been involved in this past week. And Lord, if, the, if sin is there, I pray that you would help us to deal with it. Confess it, forsake it. For we long for your mercy in our life. We long to be again the Christian that is happy as we pilgrimage along this way. And Lord, for that, we'll thank you.
Lord, there may be some that have never taken care of sin in the first place. They've never been to the foot of the cross. They've never asked Jesus to be their Savior. May today be the day of salvation. Save souls. That's our plea, Lord. Maybe right here in our own assembly this morning, maybe some that are watching. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Help people to come to understand who Christ is and what he has done for them. For the believer, Lord, those that have already recognized Christ, Lord, I pray that you help us to have a, a, a distaste for sin like you do. May we hate it. Uh, may we deal with it. May we, again, be the recipient of your mercy. And for that, we'll thank you. We want to thank you, Lord, for our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Well, hey, praise the Lord. If you're here today without Christ, we'd love an opportunity to open up God's word, show you how you can be saved. Please come to Christ today. Don't leave the same as you came if that is the need of the hour. For the believer, I hope and pray you'll deal with some of the things we just talked about here this morning. We're going to close our service by taking our hymn books, and we're going to turn to hymn number 233, Depth of Mercy. And boy, I'll tell you, the depth of God's mercy. It is endless. It is like the waves of the sea. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. Praise God for his mercy. Where would we be apart from it? When you found it, or there it is on the screen, let's all stand and sing it like we believe it. Depth of mercy. Depth of mercy can there be Mercy still reserved for me Can my God his wrath for me song. Hey, listen, I'd love to invite you back tonight. We're going to deal with uh, witnessing. And some of you might say, well, boy, I've heard about that. I know I need to do that, all that kind of stuff. But listen, come back tonight, 630. We'll be here. And by the way, uh, I, I did fail to mention this. We did have a meeting here recently talked about changing the service times. That is not happening until Sunday school gets enacted on. So we're going to continue to run 10 o'clock worship on the Sunday morning, 630 back Sunday night. You, we will try to give you as much notice ahead of time when we change the 6.30 to 6 o'clock. But for now, 6.30 every Sunday night, 10 o'clock every Sunday morning until you hear differently. Uh, but uh, we're going to be dealing with that. And I want to bring in this, uh, this uh, Jewish, this summer Jewish team that's coming our way. I want to I share some thoughts with regard to their ministry. They'll be arriving in about a week and a half. And I want us to be as prepared for them and to pray for them. They, they are the laborers. The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Here comes some six laborers our way. They're going to be knocking on doors and sharing Christ. We need to be ready for that. We need to be praying for them. We need to do all we can to help equip them to do an effective job. And so I hope you'll be back tonight at 630. Lord bless you. Have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.